Hello, my name is Victor. This video covers lessons 7 and 8 of the Master Key System. I have included a link in the description that you can use to download it for free if you're interested in reading it. Part 7. This part tells of a method by which you may construct the mold or model from which your future will emerge. It tells how you may make it grand and beautiful. It explains that you are not limited as to cost or material, that no one can place any limitation on it but yourself. It explains that in the construction of this model, there is much work to be done, that no one can do the work but yourself, but it tells you what to do and how to do it. It suggests methods and plans which if faithfully and persistently carried out will result in conditions exactly in accordance with the purpose and thought. It tells of millions of faithful helpers which will come to your aid if you are faithful in your work, and it tells why some who are apparently faithfully endeavoring to realize their ideal seem to fail. It is sometimes just as important to know what not to do as what to do. Introduction Part 7 Through all the ages man has believed in an invisible power, through which and by which all things have been created and are continually being recreated. We may personalize this power and call it God, or we may think of it as the essence or spirit, which permeates all things, but in either case the effect is the same. So far as the individual is concerned, the objective, the physical, the visible, is the personal, that which can be cognized by the senses. It consists of body, brain and nerves. The subjective is the spiritual, the invisible, the impersonal. The personal is conscious because it is a personal entity. The impersonal, being the same in kind and quality as all other being, is not conscious of itself and has therefore been termed the subconscious. The personal, or conscious, has the power of will and choice, and can therefore exercise discrimination in the selection of methods whereby to bring about the solution of difficulties. The impersonal, or spiritual, being a part or one with the source and origin of all power, can necessarily exercise no such choice, but, on the contrary, it has infinite resources at its command. It can and does bring about results by methods concerning which the human or individual mind can have no possible conception. You will therefore second that it is your privilege to depend upon the human will, with all its limitations and misconceptions, or you may utilize the potentialities of infinity by making use of the subconscious mind. Here, then, is the scientific explanation of the wonderful power which has been put within your control, if you but understand, appreciate and recognize it. One method of consciously utilizing this omnipotent power is outlined in Part 7. Part 7. Visualization is the process of making mental images, and the image is the mold or model which will serve as a pattern from which your future will emerge. Make the pattern clear, and make it beautiful, do not be afraid, make it grand, remember that no limitation can be placed upon you by anyone but yourself, you are not limited as to cost or material, draw on the infinite for your supply, construct it in your imagination, it will have to be there before it will ever appear anywhere else. Make the image clear and clean cut, hold it firmly in the mind and you will gradually and constantly bring the thing nearer to you. You can be what you will to be. This is another psychological fact which is well known, but unfortunately, reading about it will not bring about any result which you may have in mind, it will not even help you to form the mental image, much less bring it into manifestation. Work is necessary, labor, hard mental labor, the kind of effort which so few are willing to put forth. The first step is idealization. It is likewise the most important step, because it is the plan on which you are going to build. It must be solid, it must be permanent. The architect, when he plans a grand building, has every line and detail pictured in advance. The engineer, when he spans a chasm, first ascertains the strength requirements of a million separate parts. They see the end before a single step is taken, so you are to picture in your mind what you want, you are sowing the seed, but before sowing any seed you want to know what the harvest is to be. This is idealization. If you are not sure, return to the chair daily until the picture becomes plain, it will gradually unfold, first the general plan will be dim, but it will take shape, the outline will take form, then the details, and you will gradually develop the power by which you will be enabled to formulate plans which will eventually materialize in the objective world. You will come to know what the future holds for you. Then comes the process of visualization. You must see the picture more and more complete, see the detail, and, as the details begin to unfold, the ways and means for bringing it into manifestation will develop. One thing will lead to another. Thought will lead to action, action will develop methods, methods will develop friends, and friends will bring about circumstances, and, finally, the third step, or materialization, will have been accomplished. We all recognize that the universe must have been thought into shape before it ever could have become a material fact. And if we are willing to follow along the lines of the great architect of the universe, we shall find our thoughts taking form, just as the universe took concrete form. 
it is the same mind operating through the individual. There is no difference in kind or quality, the only difference is one of degree. The architect visualizes his building, he sees it as he wishes it to be. His thought becomes a plastic mold from which the building will eventually emerge, a high one or a low one, a beautiful one or a plain one. His vision takes form on paper and eventually the necessary material is utilized and the building stands complete. The inventor visualizes his idea in exactly the same manner. For instance, Nikola Tesla, he with the giant intellect, one of the greatest inventors of all ages, the man who has brought forth the most amazing realities, always visualizes his inventions before attempting to work them out. He does not rush to embody them in form and then spend his time in correcting defects. Having first built up the idea in his imagination, he holds it there as a mental picture, to be reconstructed and improved by his thought. In this way, he writes in the electrical experimenter, I am enabled to rapidly develop and perfect a conception without touching anything. When I have gone so far as to embody in the invention every possible improvement I can think of, and see no fault anywhere, I put into concrete form the product of my brain. Invariably my device works as I conceived it should, in 20 years there has not been a single exception. If you can conscientiously follow these directions, you will develop faith, the kind of faith that is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, you will develop confidence, the kind of confidence that leads to endurance and courage, you will develop the power of concentration which will enable you to exclude all thoughts except the ones which are associated with your purpose. The law is that thought will manifest in form, and only one who knows how to be the divine thinker of his own thoughts can ever take a master's place and speak with authority. Clearness and accuracy are obtained only by repeatedly having the image in mind. Each repeated action renders the image more clear and accurate than the preceding, and in proportion to the clearness and accuracy of the image will the outward manifestation be. You must build it firmly and securely in your mental world, the world within, before it can take form in the world without, and you can build nothing of value, even in the mental world, unless you have the proper material. When you have the material you can build anything you wish, but make sure of your material. You cannot make broadcloth from shoddy. This material will be brought out by millions of silent mental workers and fashioned into the form of the image which you have in mind. Think of it. You have over 5 million of these mental workers, ready and in active use, brain cells they are called. Besides this, there is another reserve force of at least an equal number, ready to be called into action at the slightest need. Your power to think, then, is almost unlimited, and this means that your power to create the kind of material which is necessary to build for yourself any kind of environment which you desire is practically unlimited. In addition to these millions of mental workers, you have billions of mental workers in the body, every one of which is endowed with sufficient intelligence to understand and act upon any message or suggestion given. These cells are all busy creating and recreating the body, but, in addition to this, they are endowed with psychic activity whereby they can attract to themselves the substance necessary for perfect development. They do this by the same law and in the same manner that every form of life attracts to itself the necessary material for growth. The oak, the rose, the lily, all require certain material for their most perfect expression and they secure it by silent demand, the law of attraction, the most certain way for you to secure what you require for your most complete development. Make the mental image, make it clear, distinct, perfect, hold it firmly, the ways and means will develop, supply will follow the demand, you will be led to do the right thing at the right time and in the right way. Earnest desire will bring about confident expectation, and this in turn must be reinforced by firm demand. These three cannot fail to bring about attainment, because the earnest desire is the feeling, the confident expectation is the thought, and the firm demand is the will, and, as we have seen, feeling gives vitality to thought and the will holds it steadily until the law of growth brings it into manifestation. Is it not wonderful that man has such tremendous power within himself, such transcendental faculties concerning which he had no conception? Is it not strange that we have always been taught to look for strength and power without? We have been taught to look everywhere but within, and whenever this power manifested in our lives we were told that it was something supernatural. There are many who have come to an understanding of this wonderful power, and who make serious and conscientious efforts to realize health, power and other conditions, and seem to fail. They do not seem able to bring the law into operation. The difficulty in nearly every case is that they are dealing with externals. They want money, power, health and abundance, but they fail to realize that these are effects and can come only when the cause is found. Those who will give no attention to the world without, will seek only to ascertain the truth, will look only for wisdom, will find that this wisdom will unfold and disclose the source of all power, that it will manifest in thought and purpose which will create the external conditions desired. This truth will find expression in noble purpose and courageous action. Create ideals only, 
Give no thought to external conditions, make the world within beautiful and opulent and the world without will express and manifest the condition which you have made within. You will come into a realization of your power to create ideals and these ideals will be projected into the world of effect. For instance, a man is in debt. He will be continually thinking about the debt, concentrating on it, and his thoughts are causes the result is that he not only fastens the debt closer to him, but actually creates more debt. He is putting the great law of attraction into operation with the usual and inevitable result, loss leads to greater loss. What, then, is the correct principle? Concentrate on the things you want, not on the things you do not want. Think of abundance, idealize the methods and plans for putting the law of abundance into operation. Visualize the condition which the law of abundance creates, this will result in manifestation. If the law operates perfectly to bring about poverty, lack and every form of limitation for those who are continually entertaining thoughts of lack and fear, it will operate with the same certainty to bring about conditions of abundance and opulence for those who entertain thoughts of courage and power. This is a difficult problem for many, we are too anxious, we manifest anxiety, fear, distress, we want to do something, we want to help, we are like a child who has just planted a seed and every 15 minutes goes out and stirs up the earth to see if it is growing. Of course, under such circumstances, the seed will never germinate, and yet this is exactly what many of us do in the mental world. We must plant the seed and leave it undisturbed. This does not mean that we are to sit down and do nothing, by no means, we will do more and better work than we have ever done before, new channels will constantly be provided, new doors will open, all that is necessary is to have an open mind, be ready to act when the time comes. Thought force is the most powerful means of obtaining knowledge, and if concentrated on any subject will solve the problem. Nothing is beyond the power of human comprehension, but in order to harness thought force and make it do your bidding, work is required. Remember that thought is the fire that creates the steam that turns the wheel of fortune, upon which your experiences depend. Ask yourself a few questions and then reverently await the response. Do you not now and then feel the self within you? Do you assert this self or do you follow the majority? Remember that majorities are always led, they never lead. It was the majority that fought, tooth and nail, against the steam engine, the power loom and every other advance or improvement ever suggested. For your next exercise visualize your friend, see him exactly as you last saw him, see the room, the furniture, recall the conversation, now see his face, see it distinctly, now talk to him about some subject of mutual interest, see his expression change, watch him smile. Can you do this? All right, you can. Then arouse his interest, tell him a story of adventure, see his eyes light up with the spirit of fun or excitement. Can you do all of this? If so, your imagination is good, you are making excellent progress. Part 7 Questions What is visualization? The process of making mental pictures. What is the result of this method of thought? By holding the image or picture in mind, we can gradually but surely bring the thing nearer to us. We can be what we will to be. What is idealization? It is a process of visualizing or idealizing the plans which will eventually materialize in our objective world. Why are clearness and accuracy necessary? Because seeing creates feeling and feeling creates being. First the mental, then the emotional, then the illimitable possibilities of achievement. How are they obtained? Each repeated action renders the image more accurate than the former one. How is the material for the construction of your mental image secured? By millions of mental workers. Brain cells they are called. How are the necessary conditions for bringing about the materialization of your ideal in the objective world secured? By the law of attraction. The natural law by which all conditions and experiences are brought about. What three steps are, necessary in order to bring this law into operation? Earnest desire, confident expectation, firm demand. Why do many fail? Because they concentrate on loss, disease and disaster. The law is operating perfectly, the things they fear are coming upon them. What is the alternative? Concentrate on the ideals which you desire to see manifested in your life. Man is mind, and evermore he takes the tool of thought, and shaping what he wills, brings forth, a thousand joys, a thousand ills. He thinks in secret and it comes to pass, environment is but his looking glass. James Allen This part tells of the creative principle of the universe, what it is, how it takes form and how it is brought into manifestation. This principle being the underlying principle of all existence must necessarily be governed by an immutable law. It tells how the character, health and circumstances of the individual are formed, and suggests methods whereby desirable conditions and circumstances may be created. It tells how and why and when the material from which your future is to emerge is secured. 
It suggests methods and exercises by which you may secure complete control of the power which governs in this mighty field of action. Mighty because it is the most important work which any individual can undertake. We are making our future now, today, when it comes we shall have to accept what is given, it will be too late to change it, but we can dominate it, control it, make it what we want it to be, and this part explains how. Introduction. Part 8. In this part you will find that you may freely choose what you think, but the result of your thought is governed by an immutable law. Is not this a wonderful thought? Is it not wonderful to know that our lives are not subject to caprice or variability of any kind? That they are governed by law. This stability is our opportunity, because by complying with the law we can secure the desired effect with invariable precision. It is the law which makes the universe one grand pan of harmony. If it were not for law, the universe would be a chaos instead of a cosmos. Here, then, is the secret of the origin of both good and evil, this is all the good and evil there ever was or ever will be. Let me illustrate. Thought results in action. If your thought is constructive and harmonious, the result will be good, if your thought is destructive or inharmonious, the result will be evil. There is therefore but one law, one principle, one cause, one source of power, and good and evil are simply words which have been coined to indicate the result of our action, or our compliance or non-compliance with this law. The importance of this is well illustrated in the lives of Emerson and Carlyle. Emerson loved the good and his life was a symphony of peace and harmony, Carlyle hated the bad, and his life was a record of perpetual discord and inharmony. Here we have two grand men, each intent upon achieving the same ideal, but one makes use of constructive thought and is therefore in harmony with natural law, the other makes use of destructive thought and therefore brings upon himself discord of every kind and character. It is evident therefore that we are to hate nothing, not even the bad, because hatred is destructive, and we shall soon find that by entertaining destructive thought we are sowing the wind and shall reap the whirlwind. Part 8. Thought contains a vital principle, because it is the creative principle of the universe and by its nature will combine with other similar thoughts. As the one purpose of life is growth, all principle underlying existence must contribute to give it effect. Thought, therefore, takes form and the law of growth eventually brings it into manifestation. You may freely choose what you think, but the result of your thought is governed by an immutable law. Any line of thought persisted in cannot fail to produce its result in the character, health and circumstances of the individual. Methods whereby we can substitute habits of constructive thinking for those which we have found produce only undesirable effects are therefore of primary importance. We all know that this is by no means easy. Mental habits are difficult to control, but it can be done and the way to do it is to begin at once to substitute constructive thought for destructive thought. Form the habit of analyzing every thought. If it is necessary, if its manifestation in the objective will be a benefit, not only to yourself, but to all whom it may affect in any way, keep it, treasure it. It is of value, it is in tune with the infinite, it will grow and develop and produce fruit an hundredfold. On the other hand, it will be well for you to keep this quotation from George Matthews Adams in mind, learn to keep the door shut, keep out of your mind, out of your office, and out of your world, every element that seeks admittance with no definite helpful end in view. If your thought has been critical or destructive, and has resulted in any condition of discord or inharmony in your environment, it may be necessary for you to cultivate a mental attitude which will be conducive to constructive thought. The imagination will be found to be a great assistance in this direction. The cultivation of the imagination leads to the development of the ideal out of which your future will emerge. The imagination gathers up the material by which the mind weaves the fabric in which your future is to be clothed. Imagination is the light by which we can penetrate new worlds of thought and experience. Imagination is the mighty instrument by which every discoverer, every inventor, open the way from precedent to experience. Precedent said, it cannot be done, experience said, it is done. Imagination is a plastic power, molding the things of sense into new forms and ideals. Imagination is the constructive form of thought which must precede every constructive form of action. A builder cannot build a structure of any kind until he has first received the plans from the architect, and the architect must get them from his imagination. The captain of industry cannot build a giant corporation which may coordinate hundreds of smaller firms and thousands of employees, and utilize millions of capital until he has first created the entire work in his imagination. Objects in the material world are as clay in the potter's hand, it is in the master mind that the real things are created, and it is by the use of the imagination that the work is done. In order to cultivate the imagination it must be exercised. Exercise is necessary to cultivate mental muscle as well as physical muscle. It must be supplied with nourishment or it cannot grow. Do not confuse imagination with fancy, or that form of daydreaming in which some people like to indulge. 
Daydreaming is a form of mental dissipation which may lead to mental disaster. Constructive imagination means mental labor, by some considered to be the hardest kind of labor, but, if so, it yields the greatest returns, for all the great things in life have come to men and women who had the capacity to think, to imagine, and to make their dreams come true. When you have become thoroughly conscious of the fact that mind is the only creative principle, that it is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent, and that you can consciously come into harmony with this omnipotence through your power of thought, you will have taken a long step in the right direction. The next step is to place yourself in position to receive this power. As it is omnipresent, it must be within you. We know that this is so because we know that all power is from within, but it must be developed, unfolded, cultivated, in order to do this we must be receptive, and this receptivity is acquired just as physical strength is gained, by exercise. The law of attraction will certainly and unerringly bring to you the conditions, environment, and experiences in life, corresponding with your habitual, characteristic, predominant mental attitude. Not what you think once in a while when you are in church, or have just read a good book, but your predominant mental attitude is what counts. You cannot entertain weak, harmful, negative thoughts 10 hours a day and expect to bring about beautiful, strong and harmonious conditions by 10 minutes of strong, positive, creative thought. Real power comes from within. All power that anybody can possibly use is within man, only waiting to be brought into visibility by his first recognizing it, and then affirming it as his, working it into his consciousness until he becomes one with it. People say that they desire abundant life, and so they do, but so many interpret this to mean that if they will exercise their muscles or breathe scientifically, eat certain foods in certain ways, drink so many glasses of water every day, of just a certain temperature, keep out of drafts, they will attain the abundant life they seek. The result of such methods is but indifferent. However, when man awakens to the truth, and affirms his oneness with all life, he finds that he takes on the clear eye, the elastic step, the vigor of youth, he finds that he has discovered the source of all power. All mistakes are but the mistakes of ignorance. Knowledge gaining and consequent power is what determines growth and evolution. The recognition and demonstration of knowledge is what constitutes power, and this power is spiritual power, and this spiritual power is the power which lies at the heart of all things, it is the soul of the universe. This knowledge is the result of man's ability to think, thought is therefore the germ of man's conscious evolution. When man ceases to advance in his thoughts and ideals, his forces immediately begin to disintegrate and his countenance gradually registers these changing conditions. Successful men make it their business to hold ideals of the conditions which they wish to realize. They constantly hold in mind the next step necessary to the ideal for which they are striving. Thoughts are the materials with which they build, and the imagination is their mental workshop. Mind is the ever-moving force with which they secure the persons and circumstances necessary to build their success structure, and imagination is the matrix in which all great things are fashioned. If you have been faithful to your ideal, you will hear the call when circumstances are ready to materialize your plans and results will correspond in the exact ratio of your fidelity to your ideal. The ideal steadily held is what predetermines and attracts the necessary conditions for its fulfillment. It is thus that you may weave a garment of spirit and power into the web of your entire existence. It is thus that you may lead a charmed life and be forever protected from all harm. It is thus that you may become a positive force whereby conditions of opulence and harmony may be attracted to you. This is the leaven which is gradually permeating the general consciousness and is largely responsible for the conditions of unrest which are everywhere evident. In your last exercise you created a mental image, you brought it from the invisible into the visible. Now I want you to take an object and follow it back to its origination see of what it really consists. If you do this you will develop imagination, insight, perception, and sagacity. These come not by the superficial observation of the multitude, but by a keen analytical observation which sees below the surface. It is the few who know that the things which they see are only effects, and understand the causes by which these effects were brought into existence. Take the same position as heretofore and visualize a battleship, see the grim monster floating on the surface of the water, there appears to be no life anywhere about, all is silence, you know that by far the largest part of the vessel is underwater, out of sight, you know that the ship is as large and as heavy as a 20-story skyscraper or the National Gallery, you know that there are hundreds of men ready to spring to their appointed task instantly, you know that every department is in charge of able, trained, skilled officers who have proven themselves competent to take charge of this marvelous piece of mechanism, you know that although it lies apparently oblivious to everything else, it has eyes which see everything for miles around, and nothing is permitted to escape its watchful vision, you know that while it appears quiet, submissive and innocent, it is prepared to hurl a steel projectile weighing thousands of pounds at an enemy many miles away, this and much more you can bring to mind with comparatively no effort whatever. 
But how did the battleship come to be where it is? How did it come into existence in the first place? All of this you want to know if you are a careful observer. Follow the great steel plates through the foundries, see the thousands of men employed in their production. Go still further back, and see the ore as it comes from the mine, see it loaded on barges or trucks, see it melted and properly treated. Go back still further and see the architect and engineers who plan the vessel. Let the thought carry you back still further in order to determine why they plan the vessel. You will see that you are now so far back that the vessel is something intangible, it no longer exists, it is now only a thought existing in the brain of the architect. But from where did the order come to plan the vessel? Probably from the Secretary of War or the First Lord of the Admiralty. Probably this vessel was planned long before war was thought of, and Parliament or Congress had to pass a bill appropriating the money. Possibly there was opposition, and speeches for or against the bill. Whom do these members of Parliament or these congressmen represent? They represent you and me, so that our line of thought begins with the battleship and ends with ourselves. And we find in the last analysis that our own thought is responsible for this and many other things, of which we seldom think, and a little further reflection will develop the most important fact of all. And that is, if someone had not discovered the law by which this tremendous mass of steel and iron could be made to float upon the water, instead of immediately going to the bottom, the battleship could not have come into existence at all. This law is that, the specific gravity of any substance is the weight of any volume of it, compared with an equal volume of water. The discovery of this law revolutionized every kind of ocean travel, commerce and warfare, and made the existence of the battleship possible. You will find exercises of this kind invaluable. When the thought has been trained to look below the surface everything takes on a different appearance, the insignificant becomes significant, the uninteresting interesting, the things which we suppose to be of no importance are seen to be the only really vital things in existence. Part 8. What is the imagination? A form of constructive thought. The light by which we penetrate new worlds of thought and experience. The mighty instrument by which every inventor or discoverer open the way from precedent to experience. What is the result of imagination? The cultivation of the imagination leads to the development of the ideal out of which your future will emerge. How may it be cultivated? By exercise, it must be supplied with nourishment or it cannot live. How does imagination differ from daydreaming? Daydreaming is a form of mental dissipation while imagination is a form of constructive thought which must precede every constructive action. What are mistakes? The result of ignorance. What is knowledge? The result of a man's ability to think. What is the power with which successful men build? Mind is the ever-moving force with which they secure the persons and circumstances necessary to complete their plans. What predetermines the result? The ideal held steadily in mind attracts the necessary conditions for its fulfillment. What is the result of a keen analytical observation? The development of imagination, insight, perception and sagacity. To what do these lead? Opulence and harmony. Look to this day. For it is life, the very life of life. In its brief course lie all the verities and realities of your existence. The bliss of growth. The glory of action. The splendor of beauty. For yesterday is but a dream. And tomorrow is only a vision. But today well lived makes every yesterday a dream of happiness, and every tomorrow a vision of hope. Look well, therefore, to this day from the Sanskrit. Advice. Remember. Fully to understand grand and beautiful thought requires, perhaps, as much time as to conceive it. Joubert. If you wish to enjoy the utmost practical benefit from the master key go slowly. Transfuse into your mind the contents of one part only, each week for 24 weeks. Realize the meaning of every phrase. Consult the master key constantly, as your perpetual help and stimulus. Each time you read the work you will get a better understanding of the eternal cosmic principles. Tell others of the master key so that more and more people may reciprocate with you, as conscious adepts in harmony. The Publishers